Hello everybody and welcome to JTV. I'm really uh, delighted to say that we have uh, a brilliant uh, author, columnist, um, chief political writer for Spiked Online. Uh, the brilliant Brendan O'Neill is here with us today. He is um, one of the few sane voices out there. Um, he's not Jewish, by the way, but um, I really wanted to get Brendan onto JTV again um, because he's written a few articles actually on Spiked, which I felt so perfectly encapsulated the really jaw-dropping response by so many people around the world to what happened in Israel. First of all, Brendan, thank you for making the time to be with us on JTV today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Ollie. Really happy to be here. So let's 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 talk a bit about what's happened in the past few weeks. You, you've brilliantly captured the the jaw dropping response around the world where truth is falsehood and falsehood is truth, where essentially anything that Israel does to protect herself is condemned. And you summarize this perfectly in, in an article you wrote called Why Won't the Jews Just Let Themselves Be Killed? And I think that basically summarizes it for us. And I want to talk about a few things that you said in that article, but do you want to just essentially summarize the premise of, of this article? Yeah, so the thing that has really alarmed me over the past two weeks, two things. Firstly, the act itself on 7th of October, which is a day that will live in infamy in the history books, uh, the worst attack on Jewish people since the Holocaust. So firstly, there's that, which uh, we, we all know the details, the chilling details of what happened on that day. But then there's been the response in the West. And even to someone like me, who has been writing about the new anti-Semitism for a long time, and who's been writing about Israel pho phobia for a long time, even I have been shocked by the response. The denialism that we've seen, where people are essentially saying, did these atrocities really happen? Where's your proof? Are you making it up? The way we've seen Israel being instantly demonized, essentially Israel had it coming because it's an evil country and its people are not real civilians, they're all colonial settlers, so what do you expect? And the way in which we've seen marches in London and in America and uh, other parts of Europe as well, in which people have essentially made the same chant that Hamas makes, which is from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. If you had told me, even a few months ago, that we would witness the worst pogrom against Jews in 80 years and that people would be on the streets using the slogan of the pogromists themselves, I wouldn't have believed you. I, 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 even I would not have believed that that was possible. And yet that is happening. And the point I make in that piece you mentioned is that if you add all this up, if you add up the demonization of Israel, the way in which every act Israel takes to defend itself from Hamas, is demonized and, and described as a war crime. What people are essentially saying is, why won't you Jews just let yourselves be killed? Why won't you let Hamas do what Hamas needs to do? Why don't you just turn the other cheek or expose your throat, open up your shirt, let yourself be shot? This is essentially what radical leftists and others in the West are saying. And I think it's genuinely repulsive and very worrying about where our societies are at at the moment. Yeah, and, and from what I understand, you, uh, at least uh, historically, have positioned yourself as being uh, somewhat on, on the left of politics. So how do you how do you make sense of this? Like the truth of the situation of the evil of Hamas and Israel's right to to do whatever they need to do to 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 defeat Hamas. The truth of the situation has never been so stark and the hypocrisy and the overt Jew hatred of the anti-Israel mob has never been so clear. And it's just been, I think, as you were saying, it's so surreal to see this stubborn, unrepentant hostility to, it, to Israel among so many across the world and even among many Western institutions, parts of the media, celebrity culture, sports culture, universities. And so it's clear to me that this goes deeper than surely than people just understanding the facts. Can you, have you tried to make sense of how, how can people get so messed up in their thinking that the truth and basic morality can get so deeply inverted? Yeah, uh, it, it's such an important question. I mean, the lack of moral clarity that we've seen from institutions and organizations in the West has been really troubling and very, very alarming. 
Um, you know, the, the, one, of the, one of the things I find very interesting is that, as we were saying earlier, everything Israel does is now described as a war crime or as genocide. So if it bombs Gaza in order to root out Hamas, that's a war crime. That's an act of genocide against the Palestinian people, apparently. But then if it asks people to move first, if it asks Palestinian civilians to clear out a certain area so that they, so that they don't get injured or killed, that's also a war crime. That's also genocide. That's being referred to as forced transfer, which is akin to an act of genocide. So it, it, the point I make in that piece that you mentioned is that when it, when it comes to Israel, even not killing people is a genocide if Israel's involved. This is the kind of Orwellian situation we've now reached. And I think the, the use of terms like genocide every time Israel takes action is really interesting because I see it as um, Jew taunting. I don't think it's about criticizing Israel anymore. I don't even think it's about criticizing Israel in a really kind of hysterical fashion, which some people might justify it in those terms. This is about taunting the Jewish nation and taunting Jewish people by saying to them, you have become the heirs of the evil that was unleashed against you in the 1930s and the 1940s. You are now the Nazis. You have become the thing that tried to destroy your, your people. It's mockery, it's taunting, it's racist abuse. So when you see people on the streets of London and other cities waving placards saying Zionists are the new Nazis, or showing um, Hitler's face morphing into Netanyahu's face. We saw that on a march in London on Saturday and other anti-Semitic caricatures as well. That's not politics, that's bigotry. That's not anti-imperialism, it's racism. And we have to be very open about that. Every comparison of Israel to the Nazis is a racist act. And everyone who goes on a demo and casually rubs shoulders with radical Islamists who are calling for holy war against Israel, which happened in London, or with people holding up placards saying that the Zionists are the Nazis and Gaza is the new Warsaw ghetto, any leftist who casually rub shoulders with poisonous ideology like that has lost any claim to be an anti-racist, has lost any claim to be a moral person, and has thrown their lot in with a new anti-Semitism. And... I think we, we just need a very upfront discussion about the fact that criticizing countries and criticizing nation states is a perfectly normal part of everyday political discussion. But that's not what is happening with Israel. Israel is being demonized to an extraordinary degree. It's been singled out and it's been racially taunted by supposed pre progressives in the West. And that's something that we really need to confront. I, I couldn't have said it better. I think that that's what I felt is really going on here. And I felt in some ways, you know, screaming at people um, who just will not see. Uh, it's not that it's not just that they want to invert the truth. But I agree with you. I think there's some kind of sadistic pleasure they get in taunting Jews. You know, so I wonder whether in some of these cases is is it worth speaking at speaking to them and trying to reason with people who are really hostile on a level it's a level of prejudice basically is it worth having conversations with people who are basically just bigoted towards jews probably not i mean lots of these people are a lost cause and um you know certainly some of the open anti-semites we saw on the streets of london on saturday on the supposed march for palestine it's not worth engaging with them i mean that guy who who shouted out um, God's curse be on the Jews. I mean, you know, you and I are not going to have a rational discussion with someone like that. But even I think some of the kind of middle class progressives on that demo are probably somewhat of a lost cause too, because their Israel phobia is now so entrenched and so unhinged that it's actually quite difficult to shake them out of it. They really have convinced themselves that Israel is a uniquely evil nation. Um, with a unique uh, kind of hypnotic power over America and Britain in particular. And they can't see how that echoes what was once said about the Jews. All the things that were traditionally said about the Jews are now said about the Jewish state. The idea that it controls world affairs, the, ideas that, the idea that it has a bloodlust, that it loves killing children, the idea that it is a malvolent force that is causing... Uh, a, interrupting world peace and causing death and destruction everywhere. This was once said about the Jewish people, now it's said about the Jewish state. I mean, that's either a really amazing coincidence 
or we've witnessed the transportation of the uh, hatred of the Jews onto the hatred of the, the Jewish nation. And I think that's what's happened. I think, you know, we have to be very honest about how serious this crisis of reason and enlightenment is. Right. We have a left wing publication in the UK. You will know it, Ollie, called Navara Media. One of its editors on the day of the 7th of October referred to it as a day of celebration. She has since deleted that tweet, but that was her response. Uh, another member of the Navara Media team said, do we support uh, Palestinian resistance or not? He said that on the day that Jews were being slaughtered for being Jews men, women, and children, uh, grandmothers, disabled people being murdered and kidnapped. And that's what they were saying. And we saw that Cornell professor who said that he found um, the Hamas attack on Israel to be invigorating. Uh, and we've seen these sentiments uh, in many, many places. And it makes me think, you know, what are these people going to say to their grandchildren when, when their grandchildren says, you know, granny, granddad, what did you do? when the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust was carried out. And they're going to have to say, we celebrated it. We apologized for it. We said we should rejoice. That was the word in the headline of the socialist worker newspaper. They said we should rejoice this attack on Israel because it has humiliated a racist country. So they're going to have to tell people in the future that when this uh, genocidal assault on the Jewish people took place, they rejoiced. They celebrated and, and that brings shame not only on those individuals but on our country as well because it raises the question of what kind of country britain has become that it contains so many people who think israel deserves to be attacked in this way and do you put a lot of this down to just deep moral confusion deeply clouded in ideology or is it just straight up jew hatred which what, what do you put it it's often it's a mick what do you put it more down to I think it, it's a combination of those two things, isn't it? I think people are just, some people are just very morally confused. They've latched onto the anti-Israel issue because it feels morally clear to them. You know, they, they might be lacking a sense of moral clarity in their lives. So they latch onto this idea that there is a uniquely evil force in the world and it is incumbent upon them to oppose it by going on marches, by boycotting Israeli goods, by refusing to engage with Israeli academics or Israeli literature as the, as the bigoted BDS movement demands. So they can kind of gain a sense of moral purity through this uh, Israel phobia. I think a lot of people are doing it for that reason, which I think is very cynical and uh, it sets a dangerous path towards outright anti-Semitism. But then there are other people who I think are becoming or have become anti-Semitic. And, you know, you mentioned that I am someone who, who traditionally comes from the left of politics. Well, you know, in the early 20th century, there were very heated discussions among leftists in Europe about the socialism of fools. And the socialism of fools was this idea that some, uh, some leftists, some radicals, some Marxists had convinced themselves that capitalism was a Jewish plot. It was all down to these nasty, conniving, money-hungry Jews. That's why capitalism was such an evil, rotten uh, uh, institution. And other leftists and Marxists and radicals said that's idiotic, that's anti-Semitic, that's a dangerous argument to make. And I think we are seeing the return of the socialism of fools. I think a lot of Corbynism, the Corbynista movement, I think, was riddled with the socialism of fools. I think the hatred for Israel could be referred to as the anti-imperialism of fools, this idea that the Jewish nation is uniquely wicked and deserves every genocidal punishment that comes its way. That's uh, the anti-imperialism of fools. So anti-Semitism has crept back into public life and into political discussion and into left-wing activism. And it is really important that everyone who supports Israel's right to exist and supports anti-racism uh, speaks out against that at every opportunity. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's interesting. H Howard Jacobson, who's also a sort of historically left-wing uh, British uh, writer, he, he said something which I think so perfectly encapsulates the phenomenon you discuss, which is that Europe never forgave the Jews the Holocaust, meaning that mm -hmm. there's a certain um, need to feel 
to, to rid oneself of the shame perhaps some people in Europe may have felt for the Holocaust so they can feel they can continue to taunt the Jews again. So we, you know, this is an opportunity to try and feel morally superior to the Jews and to shame them morally, even though, of course, it's all it's all nonsense. But I think that's that's what's going on. And I think one of the ways that perfectly proves that and you, you, you speak about this a bit in your article is the fact that, you know, you had 100,000 people out in London last Saturday basically anti-Israel, I'm not going to call it pro-Palestine, it's just an anti-Israel uh, march. And uh, where were they when you had the Syrian civil war, where you had more people killed in just a few weeks of fighting than have been killed on both sides since Israel was established in 1948? A and it's, it's so obvious that this is not about their mo concern for morality and humanitarian issues. And you said something in your article, you wrote, there's something really grim in the marshalling of the rules of war to shame Israel. Many of these rules, the Geneva Conventions, human rights laws, were introduced in the aftermath of the Second World War and the Nazis' attempted destruction of the Jews. And yet now it is the Jewish state more than ever, more than ever, more than the warmongers of the Saudi regime, the bomb-happy Turks, the destructive imperial powers of America, Britain and France that has these post-war rules barked in its face. We will protect you from genocide, the Western world said to the Jews, yet now it wags its post-war officious finger in Jews' faces because they dare to hunt down men who committed an act of genocidal terrorism against them. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I find it grimly fascinating that um, the, the rules of war, the kind of post-Second World War rules, many of them are post-Second World War, are most often deployed against the world's only Jewish state, the, the country to which uh, the prime victims of European hysteria fled after the war and set up their own country in order to protect themselves from um, uh, 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 apocalyptic anti-Semitism. It's extraordinary that it is now that country and those people who are told off about the rules of war all the time. You, you see them whenever there's a an Israeli politician on the BBC or Sky News, they just get lectured about the Geneva Conventions and human rights law and the, the sin of genocide in a way that no other leaders do. It's so blatantly one-sided. And it's interesting you mentioned the Syrian conflict there. You're absolutely right. There have been so many conflicts in recent years that have killed vast numbers of civilians. And I've not seen protests. I've not seen, certainly not mass protests. I've not seen uh, Sky News presenters or BBC presenters wagging their fingers at the leaders of those nations. Saudi Arabia, for example, they killed around 9,000 civilians in Yemen over the past few years. And now Saudi Arabia is telling Israel to show restraint. I mean, it's just this grotesque hypocrisy. And you mentioned Syria. What's interesting about the calamity in Syria over the past uh, decade and more is that many, many Palestinians were killed in that conflict. I think maybe around 3,000 Palestinians died as a result of the Syrian war. Um, around 100,000 Palestinians were displaced during that war because, of course, Syria has a very large number of Palestinians there. Uh, where were the protests for those Palestinians? Where was the concern for, th for their deaths in conflict or their displacement? I, d I don't remember seeing that referred to as forced transfer or a genocide of the Palestinian people. So you're right, this is not about being pro-Palestine. They don't give a damn about Palestinian people, actually. Uh, Hamas certainly doesn't. Hamas knew very well that, it, that when it went into um, Israel and slaughtered 1,400 people, it knew very well that there would be consequences, and it knew very well that people in Gaza would die as a result of those consequences. It basically sacrificed Palestinian people for the PR benefit of getting global sympathy for its cause. This is how cynical and monstrous Hamas is. It, not only is it willing to kill Israelis, it's willing to sacrifice Palestinians in order to get influencers and lovies and leftists in the West on the streets hollering their hatred for Israel. And it completely succeeded at that. It, it, it goaded these uh, influencers onto the streets to play their part in its kind of vain, demented war on Israel. So the whole thing is just kind of slightly sick making. And I think there's there's a real, there's a very grim element to the way in which the post Second World War rules and um, principles are so often wielded in Israel, because it is about saying, 
look, we helped you when you were suffering in the Holocaust, and now you are behaving like the architects of the Holocaust. That's essentially the libel that has been issued against Israel all the time. And, you know, I saw this very sinister chant in Berlin on one of their anti-Israel protests, where lots of young um, Berliners were chanting, free Palestine from German guilt. And they were chanting this in English, which was very interesting in itself, but they were chanting it very forcefully. And I thought that really sums this up because there is now this generation in Europe that is becoming very cavalier about the Holocaust, um, which feels that it shouldn't even have to think about it or talk about it very much. It waters down the uniqueness of the Holocaust all the time by referring to the Palestinian Holocaust or the Palestinian genocide, when in truth, the number of Palestinian people has risen enormously over the past few decades. It certainly hasn't declined by 6 million, which is what happened in Europe in the 1940s. So I, I find all this uh, wielding of Holocaust talk against Israel to be blatantly racist, deeply cynical, and actually quite horrific. And I fully understand why Israel takes grave offense at that. Yeah. And what's wild to me is that it's only 75 years since the Holocaust. You know, people, we, the Jewish community used to talk about, gosh, you know, uh, maybe in a generation or two after all the survivors die, uh, maybe what are we going to do to ensure that, that you know, the, the message still, still remains and that we don't allow something like this to happen again. And they haven't even died yet. There, there's still many survivors okay. who are still around. There was a Holocaust survivor taken hostage in Gaza. I mean, it, it's it's just, it's jaw-dropping. But at the same time, many Jews are sort of thinking, well, maybe it's not so jaw-dropping because this has always been Jewish people's story. What, what do you say to those? I just want to have a very clear message here um, because one of the things that I see a lot of perhaps the anti-Israel spokespeople who go on TV and they've got, they're dressed in their suits and they, they argue things in sort of in a more dignified way. Um, and they say, look, ultimately the root of all this, the root problem here is Israeli occupation. It's occupation that's the, the problem here. And I often don't even know what they mean by that. What are you talking about? What do you say to people, people that say that in light of all this? Um, it's victim blaming. It's basically saying Israel deserved this. Um, it's basically saying that Israel deserved the worst attack on uh, the Jewish people since the Holocaust. That's what they're saying. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've, I've written about the double racism inherent in this argument. So firstly, there's the racism of singling Israel out for more opprobrium than any other country in the world and talking about it as genocidal and evil and so on. That, that I think, is, is clearly um, anti-Semitic, clearly has racist undertones. But there's also the racism of absolving the Palestinian people, uh, in particularly members of Hamas, of responsibility for what they do. It kind of, it demonizes Israel and it infantilizes Palestinian Arabs. And it essentially says to Hamas and, and their supporters, well, you know, what do you expect them to do? They're really sad. They're really oppressed. They have no choice but to go into Israel and slit people's throats. They have no other choice but to go into Israel and burn alive mothers and children. That is racist against Palestinians, right? And, and what, what, people are, what these campaigners are actually saying is that Israel is mature enough to enjoy criminal responsibility for its actions, but Palestinians are not. Israel is mature enough as a country to be held responsible for dropping bombs that kill civilians, but Palestinians are not. Uh, mature enough to be held responsible for what they did in the south of Israel. That was just a kind of Pavlovian reaction to oppression. That was a, a like an infantile cry for help. It was if any if they make any criticism at all, they will say it was a kind of ta the tantrum of the oppressed. So there's this double racism taking place. There's the racism of Israelophobia, and there's a racism of this really grotesque infantilization of Palestine as the child of global affairs that requires these wise, usually white Western progressives to look after it, to care for it, to cry for it, to march for it in the streets. It, I find it really repulsive, I have to say. And I, I, I've often found that Palestine solidarity campaigns are actually incredibly infantilizing and paternalistic 
and not like the solidarity campaigns one might have seen in the past with countries that were genuinely oppressed or people who were genuinely uh, being repressed by certain regimes. So it's, there's a double racism going on here. And I would simply say that the, the people who bear responsibility for the current mess in the Middle East that we're seeing on our TV screens every night is Hamas. Hamas started this war. It killed uh, more than a thousand Israelis uh, in the most barbaric way imaginable. Uh, genuine crimes against humanity. It knew very well that Israel, Israel would respond. It knew perfectly well that there would be a response and that it would be a severe response. Hamas started this war. Israel has every right to try to finish it. And if people say this is all Israel's doing, they are simply victim blaming. You know, that's supposed to be the great crime amongst the kind of identitarian left. You know, there's nothing worse than victim blaming, but that's exactly what they're doing here. And I think it is racist against Israel to suggest that it should turn the other cheek to genocidal terrorism. But it's also racist against the Palestinians who are infantilized as people who aren't really responsible for what they do. I think we have to rise above those arguments, recognize the criminal culpability of Hamas for the current war and make the argument to Hamas. If you want this war to stop, it seems very simple to me. Hamas has got to release all the Israeli hostages immediately it has to surrender to Israel on terms that Israel uh, finds acceptable, and it has to agree to disarm. That's the only way to stop this war. Mm. It's interesting you make that point. There's a bigotry of low expectations when it comes to talking about um, Arab Palestinians. Um, but there's also this bigotry in terms of saying to Israel, well, we hold Israel to a higher standard because you're a Western country. And so we, we're, we're only saying this because we expect you to act better than them. No, that that's also taunting yeah. Jews basically because the standard that you're looking for is the standard it's, it's basically as you said to fall on your sword because it's not possible the kind of standards that they're demanding of Israel uh, it's not they're just simply not realistic and obviously just uh, uh, used as a, a weapon to taunt Israel um, do you think though contrary to we're seeing a lot of um, pundits and British institutions and Western institutions universities the rest of it elites um, who are spouting this bigotry towards Israel. Um, but do you think people around the world, the general public, the silent majority, um, are waking up because of this? Do you, you know, it certainly seems from some polling done in America and the UK that the majority of actual citizens do support Israel's, um, you know, defense, defense and all the rest of it. What do you, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I, I hope so. And I, I have seen indications of that as well in, in polling, which seems to suggest that ordinary people, good, decent people don't certainly don't share the anti-Israel hysteria of the kind of chattering class and the academic elites and the, the so-called progressives. So I have seen that and that gives me hope. There's also a very interesting generational split, which has been revealed in, in polls here in the UK which seem to suggest that while young people, perhaps not surprisingly, especially if they're on social media all day long, um, or they listen to pop stars or they read certain left-wing outlets, young people tend to be much more pro-Palestine. Let's put quote marks around that. Um, whereas older generations have a stronger belief that Israel has a right to defend itself. And, and they seem to recognize what's at stake here, which is that a, a, a violently regressive radical Islamist outfit has just committed an atrocity of historical proportions against Israel. And they recognize that that's a very serious matter. So yeah, I think there are lots of people out there who probably don't like war. They don't like what they're seeing on their TV screens. You know, the BBC, it, its coverage is is extraordinary. It's, it's it, they, they are myopically obsessed with the horrors that Israel is allegedly committing. They haven't given this kind of coverage to any other recent war, um, maybe the Syrian war when it started, and of course the Ukrainian war, but they kind of forgot about those very quickly. Uh, but with Israel, I think they're gonna drag this out for as long as possible. So I'm worried that the more people are subjected to mainstream propaganda about evil Israel, the more that we might see a problematic shift in public opinion. I'm hoping that doesn't happen, but it is something that concerns me. For the time being, I think you're right. There is a silent majority who recognizes that either that this, is, this is more complicated than people are saying, or that Israel certainly has a right to defend itself. 
And, you know, I've, I've been involved in helping to set up a new group called the British Friends of Israel. And this week, the week that you and I are talking, we released uh, the founding statement, which is called the October Declaration. And it's signed by some brilliant people, Tom Stoppard, Maureen Lipman, uh, Andrew Neal, Ian Hersey Alley, uh, me and many, many others. And um, in the first few hours that it was released, we got thousands and thousands of people signing it. This is a declaration which stands against anti-Semitism, which says we must refer to Hamas as terrorists, and which recognizes that the atrocities of 7th of October were the worst anti-Semitic acts since the Holocaust and are entirely responsible for the current conflict. So that's getting thousands of signatures. I hope it gets thousands more because that's a way in which I think the silent majority can stop being silent and, and put their name to a statement at least, which says, listen, uh, this is not evil Israel uh, uh, committing genocide against an innocent people. This is a war that was started by Hamas and which involved grave war crimes and which Israel has every right to defend itself against. Wow. Well, thank you for, for making that. I saw that actually, and that was really, you know, it was really good to see. Um, it, it's funny as well that you mentioned, you know, talk about the media's obsession with, with what's going on. I often want to ask people and the critics, like, it's, you're, you're not saying anything valuable or helpful by focusing on the inevitable casualties of war when you have no alternative to offer. And that's the thing that I often want to say to people. What what are you suggesting Israel do differently? And they never do that. They just say, oh, look at this explosion that happened. Well, welcome to war. Mm. Welcome to defeating mm. an enemy. And it's it, it's just, it's so basic, this stuff. So this is what I want to ask you next. How did you come to recognize the truth? What does it take? You know, you're not Dru Jewish. You grew up firmly on the left of politics, as you say. What does it take for someone to just acknowledge these basic truths? I think it, for me, it it took some time. It's it, I've been writing about this issue and the problem of the socialism of fools and the problem of Israelophobia. I've been writing about it for a long time now, maybe 20 years. And um, it, it, just over that period, I recognized that it, it was even a greater problem than I thought. Bit by bit, every time there was a conflict in the Middle East or a blow up of tensions, you could see it getting worse and worse, the response of people in the West, the, the hatred for Israel, the pity for Palestine, the toxic combination of those two political ideologies. You could see it getting worse every time. This time, it's been so bad that even I've been shocked. And I am someone who's been writing about um, the problems of the racist left and the problems of Israelophobic progressives. I've been writing about it for years. And even I've been shocked by what's happening. You know. One thing we're seeing, for example, is a new form of Holocaust denialism in real time. You know, you have people now all over social media, influential people, not just racist lunatics in the cesspit of the Internet, saying, well, where's the proof that these atrocities committed by Hamas actually took place? Show us the images, show us the dead babies, offer up, uh, you know, footage of your corpses and, and then maybe we'll believe it. Actually, even then they don't believe it and they say they are AI generated images or they say they're photoshopped. I, I, I've been so shocked by that. It's, it's kind of hard to put it into words. And you start to understand how it was possible that people didn't believe that the Holocaust was happening. Um, you know, you start to understand what 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 bigotries must have existed for people to say, oh, I'm sure that's all just made up because uh, we're seeing the same thing again now. So I, I have found that incredibly disturbing. And I think the, the the broader concern for me is that there is this kind of there's a hysteria in the West at the moment. There's an anti-reason, anti-enlightenment, anti-truth movement. You see it not just in relation to the Israel discussion, but on many, many issues. And one consequence that that is having, and I think we're going to see this play out in the coming weeks, is the weakening of the idea of, of what the Holocaust meant. You mentioned earlier on that the Holocaust happened within living memory. There are still people alive who were either victims of it or um, assisted in some way in perpetrating it. Uh, this is a, a, an event in living memory. And I think we're witnessing something very peculiar at the moment, which we might refer to as Holocaust envy. 
Because one of the problems in contemporary society, I think, is the politics of victimhood. Mm. And there is this fashion for being a victim. There's this mm. fashion for being frail and vulnerable. And that's one reason people are drawn to the Palestinian cause, because they see the Palestinians, Palestinians as the world's ultimate victims. And it kind of gives them a, a sense of moral authority that they can uh, fawn over these victims. And one of the consequences of victim culture is that people are chipping away at the Holocaust and its uniqueness because they are essentially jealous that Jewish people have this claim to the worst crime in human history. And you, you see that in the way in which they will now use the word genocide for all sorts of terrible events that are not, however terrible they are, they are not comparable to the Holocaust. Or the way in which they will refer to Gaza as being like the Warsaw Ghetto, which is a form of Holocaust denialism. Uh, or the way in which, you know, the Muslim Council of Britain, for example, has previously refused to take part in Holocaust Memorial Day until other genocides are included as well, like Srebrenica or, or uh, Rwanda, I think, and, and so on. There is this attempt to dismantle the truth of the Holocaust itself, to bring that event tumbling back down to earth, to say it wasn't actually all that special, it wasn't all that unique, and the Jews should stop going on about it. And that I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the coming weeks. I think we're going to see a lot more Holocaust relativism, a lot more atrocity denialism, and a lot more people saying, well, actually, the Palestinians are now suffering as badly as the Jews once did. We've got to look out for that, because if we can't defend historical truth and truth itself, then we really have lost this fight. Absolutely. That was said so well. And it's interesting, like the Jewish people for centuries have tried to teach the world especially a bit bearing the brunt of prejudice about the importance of caring for all and the, the victims and the underdog and the second the world claims to start to understand that privilege they use it to you know they twist mm -hmm. it as a way to to, to, to have a go at, at the jews it, it's it's amazing it's a remarkable turn in, in history and it's so interesting what you say about um the glorification of the victim right because I think part of why Israel also is so um, bothersome to people that, that, that hate Israel and, and talk about the victimhood of, of the Palestinians is that Israel breaks th the rule of this whole victim culture. You know, Israel, the Jewish people, are, are a group of people that say we will not be defined by our victimhood and we're not going to obsess over it. And I think that's also why they really, really ha hate Israel because it, it breaks that whole, you know, doctrine that, you are defined by your victimhood and generational trauma and all the rest of it. And, and uh, Israel is a living, breathing example of why that doesn't need to be the case. I, I want to know what, what do you think ultimately? Have you, it's, it, people often struggle to, have struggled to figure this out, but what, what is your sense of what ultimately motivates hatred towards Jews? Uh, well, it's, it's such a sweeping question, isn't it? Because it, it's got so many historical expressions. I think Jake Wallace Simon's new book on Israelophobia is really good on this question. And he traces the changing nature of anti-Semitism historically. So traditionally, a, a long time ago, there was religious anti-Semitism, the view of Jews as the Christ killers and the, sac the sacrifices of Christian babies these sinister figures on the outskirts of society and every now and then they had to be completely expelled from society in order for society to survive. So there was religious hatred for a long time. In the 20th century, it becomes a bit more scientific racism. I'm doing quote marks around scientific. You know, there's a kind of biological racism in the, in the 20th century where the Jews are seen as germ-like, you know, a, a, tox, a, a toxin in society, a, a bad influence. Uh, the controller of global affairs, this kind of poisonous, nefarious influence on our lives and our societies. And of course, that led to pogroms and eventually to the Holocaust. I think we're seeing a new expression of it now in the language of social justice. This is what makes it so slippery. It's now woke language that is used, seemingly politically correct language, even anti-racist language that is being uh, uh, misused in this case. It, to further a new form of anti-Semitism. And I think that's one of the challenges we face, Ollie, which is that um, so often anti-Semitism gets dressed up as anti-racism. So people will say, I've seen people say over the past week or so, I've seen them say, um, 
you know, we, we need to, the, the only reason we're criticizing Israel is because we're anti-racist, we're anti-genocide, and Israel is committing a genocide. But of course, that becomes their way of excusing the genocidal terrorism that was inflicted on Israel by a group that was set up expressly to kill Jews. So they can kind of gloss over their support or their apologism for that in the language of anti-racism. So it puts us in a difficult position because it means we have to pick apart their claims to anti-racism and make the point that there is nothing anti-racist in what they're doing. And in fact, they are inflaming a, a new version of the oldest form of racism, which is hatred for the Jewish people. So it's so important to unpick that and untangle that and to make the case for a genuine anti-racism, which treats no people as either superior or inferior on their basis of their ethnic heritage or their racial heritage. That's the kind of argument I think we need to make. They're certainly not making that argument at all. But the other thing I think we need to challenge is, is the lie of moral equivalence, because we're seeing this all the time now, and you see it a lot in the media coverage. You see this, people will say, well, you know, Israel has killed some kids in Gaza, um, so is it really any different to Hamas? And people will say Israel has now killed more people in Gaza, according to Hamas figures, than Hamas killed in southern Israel. This is so morally infantile, it's kind of difficult to get your mind around it. Because if people cannot see the difference between civilians dying as a consequence of war, which is incredibly tragic and has happened in every war in history, if they can't see the difference between civilians tragically dying as a consequence of war and people being murdered because of their race, then they are a lost cause. There is no moral equivalence between Israel regretfully and in some cases tragically causing the deaths of civilians in its war on Hamas. There's no comparison between that and Hamas going into southern Israel and killing people on the presumption that they were Jews, killing children, mothers, grandmothers, disabled people, uh, hunting them down at a music festival, uh, stabbing them to death, burning them alive, shooting them because they were Jewish. These are utterly incomparable. And the idea that Israel would do anything like that is such a repugnant lie. The idea that Israel would commit a conscious racial genocide and target civilians on the basis of their ethnicity is a, is a lie. So that, that kind of lie of moral equivalence also really needs to be challenged so that we can have an honest sense of moral clarity about what is at stake here. And what is at stake here is that a, an apocalyptically violent movement of Jew haters has declared war on Israel. And I know which side of that I'm going to be taking. Yeah. And you spoke really eloquently about how anti-Semitism has evolved and mutated through the generations. But my question was really about, have you gave any thought to the question of why does it what the common denominator which is targeting the jews like can you have you thought what it is that's motivating human beings to constantly point at the jews throughout all generations what what's the common factor do you, a lot of people don't know but have you have you thought what that could be uh, it, it's such a good question. I mean, I think it's it, it, I think it's probably that it's such a long standing form of hatred that it it finds its way back into contemporary life in one way or another. That's you know, it's it's there's such a long history of it that you can borrow from it. If you really want to find a scapegoat in society, if you really want to say, listen, the reason the world is going to crap is because of this group of people over here people often feel the instinct to make those simplistic points, those simplistic gestures. And if there is a long history of people saying it in relation to Jews, then that's what people are going to reach for. So there is this kind of, uh, the, the, the re-expression of this hatred all the time is, is fascinating. And I think one of the things that underpins anti-Semitism, it often makes an appearance in very dark times in, in Western society in particular. Uh, I know it exists around the world, but the manifestations of it in Western society are very interesting because it's often during a downturn in enlightenment values, a crisis of reason, a crisis of truth. It's often in that those moments that anti-Semitism makes its reappearance because what happens is that people start turning away from truth and reason and 
uh, moral clarity and they start looking for someone to scapegoat for the problems in their own lives or the problems in their society or the problems in the world. So they turn away from rational discussion about the problems we face and what we might do about them towards looking for a group of people or an organization that we can just point the finger at and say they're to blame for everything. That's what I think we're seeing now with Israelophobia. There is a, the return of that instinct to blame the Jewish people for all the ills of the world and to rage against them on that um, defamatory basis. So why is it the Jews every time? I think it's probably because there is such a history of it. it there's, a, there's a historical memory in our societies, sadly, of Jew hatred, and, and, and therefore it can lend itself to modern manifestations of conspiracy theory, anti-enlightened thinking, um, the search for scapegoats. And I think that's definitely what we're seeing now. I, I really do, I don't want to over-egg it, but I really do think civilization is on the line at the moment. I don't think our societies are going to collapse anytime soon. I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to do uh, the politics of fear or anything like that. But the events of the past two weeks have raised the question about whether we are on the side of Western civilization or not. Are we on the side of defending democratic countries, free countries, defending the Jewish people from a, an incredibly reactionary, backward, racist movement and its pathetic apologists in the West? What side are we on there? And, and that really is a question that confronts us all. And I, I think the more of us who speak up for the values of Western civilization, which includes the right of Jewish people to live in peace, the better. Well, this was actually going to be my final question to you, Brendan. Um, and I wanted to quote uh, one of the last paragraphs in your article where you, you, you wrote, it is a warning sign to civilization itself that Jewish children have been killed for being Jewish children. That in this new millennium, the genocidal execution of Jews has returned. The Western world fails to recognize at its peril what a vast moral challenge this poses to the enlightened values we claim to hold dear. And as you said, this has really opened the lid in ways you, you didn't expect uh, on all kinds of prejudices bubbling under the surface. So what, what do you think is going to happen next? And like, what, what, do you, what do you suspect is going to be the, the future for the West and civilized countries? I, I think we're, we're, we're at a crossroads. And the question of what happens next comes down to us as well as other people. And I think that's something that's really worth bearing in mind. You know, um, it's tempting at moments like this because so many awful things are happening and awful things are being said. It's tempting to kind of throw one's hands in the air and say, oh God, we're all, we're all going to hell in a handcart. I certainly feel that sometimes. I've certainly felt it over the past couple of weeks. But what we do matters as well. And by we, I don't just mean me and you, I mean the silent majority that you talked about, the, the people out there who, who understand, I think, at some level what's, what's at risk at the moment. And um, it's, it's incumbent upon us to speak up for the values of Western civilization and to speak up for reason and truth and to challenge anti-Semitism in all its forms. You know, uh, Manuel Walls, the, the former prime minister of France, he did a, an excellent speech um, after the Charlie Hebdo massacre. You'll remember, Ollie, that, that there was the Charlie Hebdo massacre, but there was also the kosher Delhi massacre at the same time. I think four Jews were killed in that shortly after the massacre of the cartoonists. And he did an excellent speech in which he said, um, when this hatred returns, it, it speaks to a crisis of the Republic. And he was talking in that case about the French Republic and the values of France, the values of modern France. And he said, if um, France without its Jews is not France. And it was a really good, important rallying cry to decency in the West and to the enlightenment values that we claim to hold dear, which include reason, freedom and tolerance. And I think we need to say the same thing now. We know for a fact that lots of pe Jewish people, you know this better than I, lots of Jewish people in Britain, are not happy at the moment. They don't feel very safe. They're worried about the displays of anti-Semitism that we're seeing on the streets of London and other cities. And I think the most pressing task facing us at the moment is to offer meaningful solidarity with Jewish people, real solidarity with the state of Israel. And then beyond that, making the case for recovering those values that have stood our societies in good stead for a long time and rejecting the regressive 
politics and the hysterical politics of the new elites and of radical Islamists. And that's, that's really what we need to do, I think, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, and, and probably in the coming years. Absolutely. And I, I just, there's one other point I wanted to quickly ask you about, because I, I feel it is relevant to the British Jewish community. Um, and that's the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer. Because many, some people in the Jewish community feel that he's shown that he's kicking out the anti-Semites and standing for Israel's right to self-defense and all the rest of it. I still really struggle with the fact that this man tried to get Jeremy Corbyn into Downing Street just a few years ago, not when he was a student activist, not when he was, you know, young and inexperienced, just a few years ago. And maybe he'll say it was that was just political opportunism. In my mind, there are some things which cross a, a red line and it's not acceptable, even if you can't justify it with political opportunism. And he was asked by Beth Rigby, the Sky News reporter, just last week, was he get trying to get many British Jews are wondering, was he trying to get Corbyn into power because he had to, because he actually wanted to? And he, he was asked this and he said, look, I always want a Labour government, but we lost our way. And he kept saying that I always want a Labour government, but we lost our way. And he, she said, do you regret trying to get him in? Same answer. That to me is not really, really acceptable. Um, he, and I don't know why he doesn't say that. Just wondered if you had any reflections on that. You know, it really is extraordinary. I wrote about this for the Daily Mail um, uh, about a week ago. It is extraordinary that had the 2019 general election gone a different way and had Corbyn won, this country could have a prime minister, a man in Downing Street who once referred to Hamas as his friends at the exact time that Hamas was slaughtering Jewish people, including British born Jews. We could have had a prime minister that refer, that once referred to these genocidal lunatics, these racist terrorists as his friends. And the seriousness of that, I don't think people have fully comprehended at just how what a catastrophe that would have been and what a catastrophe it was that Labour was led by such a man for a long period of time. And as you say, and this is the point I made in the piece I wrote for the Mail. It's also not as simple as saying, well, Corbyn's gone now, what a relief. Because as you say, Keir Starmer lobbied for him to be in control of the country. So did many other uh, people in the current uh, Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet and people around at the top of the Labour Party. They lobbied for a man who we all knew had referred to Hamas as his friends. They lobbied for that man to be the prime minister. Hamas's founding charter committed it to an Ex existential struggle against the Jews. As recently as 2021, Hamas officials have called for people to cut off Jewish people's heads. It has made no uh, apology, has never tried to hide the fact that it is a violently anti-Semitic movement. Corbyn knew that at some level when he referred to them as his friends, and Keir Starmer knew that when he lobbied for Corbyn to get into power. So Labour is not it, Labour has questions to answer, and it, unless it has a very honest reckoning with its very recent past, unless it has a reckoning with the socialism of fools and the way in which that was able to infiltrate the party for a period of time, then I think it will remain a bit of a lost cause. Labour has to be honest about what happened to its party in recent years, and it now has to make it very clear that it doesn't stand with any form of anti-Semitism and that it condemns Hamas and that it fully supports Israel. We need to hear it, Labour saying that before I think we can really believe that it has changed in a fundamental way. Yeah. And do you think Starmer can absolve himself of what he did? I think what he does in the next few weeks will probably determine that. I think I can see him buckling already. That's what's interesting. He, he did make a few pretty good, clear statements about supporting Israel's right to defend itself. But he is he moves in circles you know the, the kind of dinner party scenes in uh, parts of middle class leafy london where sad to say there is a lot of israelophobia and sometimes it, just anti-semitism i mean he does move in those circles he will move in circles where people will be saying israel's committing a genocide the Gazans are being wiped out israel is uniquely problematic he moves in those circles that that's a fact that's what those kinds of people say. I hear them say it myself. Um, so I think he's under pressure from his cultural elite that he is a member of 
probably to start distancing himself from taking a clear position in defense of Israel and in defense of Western values. So let's see how much he buckles. But I think unless he makes a makes it very clear that the Labour Party is a party that does not tolerate any form of anti-Semitism, which condemns Hamas constantly and which supports the right of this democratic country to defend itself. Unless he makes that very clear, I don't see why Jewish people in Britain should vote for Labour and I don't see why any decent person should vote for Labour. We need to hear that it has changed in a, in a meaningful way. Well, Brendan, thank you so much for your time. We've really had a lengthy discussion. Greatly appreciate it. I know all of you as well, um, who are both here in Britain and across the world. Um, thank you for your friendship and all your activism. And uh, I hope we can have more enlightening conversations in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Ollie.